This episode, I spoke to Dr. Richard Barry of NASA's Goddard Flight Center to find out how the Hubble Space Telescope changed our view of the universe and why finding life beyond Earth isn't a matter of if, but when. Well, I am Richard Barry. I am a research astronomer in the Laboratory for Exoplanets and Stellar Astrophysics at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm also the observatory project scientist for Hubble Space Telescope. Thanks very much for um, speaking to me today, uh, Richard. It's great to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I, I was wanting to sort of start off by, by talking about, about the, the, the Hubble Space Telescope, because you're the uh, observatory project scientist uh, on the mission, as, as, as you just said. Uh, what does that role actually involve? My primary purpose is to keep a very close eye on Hubble Space Telescope as its components age. So it's been it's been 30 years since we launched it. Actually, I was the person that launched Hubble Space Telescope from Kennedy Space Center. I used to be a, a space shuttle engineer back in the day. And um, so I was the guy who was sitting on launch console when we launched it. So it's been a long time. And these, uh, amazingly, uh, it just keeps working. And it just is, it's, it's an amazing piece of hardware. But to try to make sure that we can use it for as long as possible because it has a very important um, a, a science that it can do uh, in, in tandem with James Webb's space telescope. So James Webb works primarily in the uh, infrared, near and mid-infrared uh, wavelength ranges, whereas Hubble can work in optical and the UV ranges. And so those, there is a... a a really good uh, dynamism between those two observatories. So my my job really is to try to understand uh, changes in Hubble Space Telescope uh, in the observatory parts of it. Uh, so the, the gyros, the high gain antenna, uh, the pointing systems, uh, watch those things very closely and to try to adapt as it changes. That's, that's really, really interesting. And it's, it's especially interesting because I think you do hear quite a lot nowadays talk of when's the when's Hubble going to retire, you know, and then JWST labeled as a su- successor. It seems like it's Hubble doesn't have long to go, but would you would you disagree with that? I would really disagree. It's uh, And it's not just because I love Hubble so much. It's just been a, an amazing fire hose of science data for, for astronomy. But um, it as I mentioned, there is this dynamism. And so um, James Webb Space Telescope, it will be looking for first stars and it's going to be looking for exoplanets around other stars. And uh, there are many very important things that Hubble still can contribute while observing simultaneously with JW. I'll, I'll just call James Webb Space Telescope. We refer to it as JW at NASA. So uh, it has... Um, uh, Hubble Space Telescope has uh, a lot to say about that. So, for instance, uh, suppose that we're interested in studying the stellar companion of a known exoplanet, a new exoplanet, and we want to know what the environment of that exoplanet is. Um, a lot of that you can't really tell very much about the star in the infrared, whereas in the UV, you can see if the star has flaring activity. Um, Most of the stars in the universe are these, what are called M dwarfs, they're these little dim red stars. And so most of the exoplanets that we'll find will be around these dim red stars. And they are often chromospherically very active. And you can't tell until you look in the UV. So uh, if, if you parked a small planet and a civilization next to one of these stars, it would be uh, uh, simply sterilized every three or four days, just completely sterilized by these flares. So it'd be a horrible place to look for life. So before we go and start drilling in on any particular uh, planet, we should just check with Hubble Space Telescope, see if it's see if it's going to be a good place to put, a, put life or not <laughs> before we even bother to look. <laughs> so that, that's just one example. But um, yeah, those capabilities, the dynamism between the two observatories is just beautiful. And isn't it incredible that, um, I'm pretty sure I've got this right, that at the time the Hubble Space Telescope was, was conceived of, the first exoplanet hadn't been discovered. That, that's correct, isn't it? So it's, it's not even as if Hubble was designed to look for exoplanets. It's sort of, um, it's, it, it's 
its versatility really comes across, doesn't it? When, when you look at it doing something that it wasn't actually designed for. Right, right. Yeah, they um, exoplanets were just a concept when we launched Hubble back in 90. So the first exoplanet detected was uh, 51 Pegasi, which was back in uh, 1995. Uh, so it has turned out that we... Oh, and a very interesting, this is another thing that we, we might want to discuss. We've just detected a new uh, stellar mass black hole using Hubble Space Telescope and gravitational microlensing. So very cool result from Hubble. And that was just this past week. So these um, uh, small stellar mass black holes are very hard to detect. The universe should be just full of them. But we, we now have direct evidence and a measurement of a mass, of a, a stellar mass black hole using Hubble. So you're just not going to get that with other types of telescopes. So uh, let's see. I think I've rather forgotten what the question was. But um, did I ever answer? <laughs> That's just like me. I'll go running off. Uh, my poor students call it a coffee field sermon. I just wander off and start talking about whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you uh, did, yeah. I mean, it, it was really just um, that that notion that um, Hubble wasn't designed, you know, to um, to look for exoplanets, but 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 here we are. Yeah, yeah. Such a, you know, uh, the suite of instruments on Hubble Space Telescope. One of the beautiful things about it is that we've been able to uh, gr- grapple it with the space shuttle and replace um, the instrument suite, or at least parts of it, uh, over time, and adapt to whatever science direction science is going because there are a lot of unknown unknowns. And so over time we've, we've adjusted the suite of instruments to allow us to make more headway on the science. And I, I was, I'm, I'm still saddened that we couldn't do something similar to that uh, with James Webb space telescope, but you know, it's out all the way out at Lagrangian point two. And we just don't have a way to get out there and, and, and change instruments out. We're just going to have to work with, with what's there. And those are just great instruments uh, for now. But that Hubble was an was a, uh, example of a very adaptable system, a very general purpose observatory, which has changed over time and allowed us to um, attune our instrumentation to the latest scientific questions pretty cool definitely pretty cool i mean um it's interesting you're, you're talking, talking about the instruments there because it was this month as we're recording um was the 20th anniversary of the uh, advanced camera for surveys um, i was wondering if you, could, if you could talk a bit about that and, and, and exactly why why that's such a such a such a big uh, instrument yeah that's a really that's a great question so the pi for uh, advanced camera for surveys which is uh, acs is Holland Ford, and he's at Johns Hopkins. And interestingly enough, he was my doctoral research uh, uh, advisor when I was at Johns Hopkins. So my second career is in astronomy, and I went to Hopkins with, at the time, uh, the advanced camera for surveys had just been um, uh, mounted in Hubble Space Telescope, and there was just this beehive of activity at Johns Hopkins around this. But the advanced camera for surveys takes the the most recent, most powerful detectors and allows us to do these very large survey uh, observations. And these survey, we're actually going to be launching another spacecraft in 2025 called Roman Space Telescope that will have even broader uh, field of regard. But uh, it it allowed Hubble to have its broadest field of regard and to collect um, statistical information about stars and distribute it on the sky. And it has allowed us to do uh, make a lot of progress on some of these big questions about stellar evolution, about uh, planet formation theory. And uh, so that's why that instrument was so, so terribly important. It still is. It's still uh, uh, very important. And the... I remember uh, not too many years ago when one of its main power supplies failed uh, on orbit, and we did come up with some solutions uh, right here at Goddard um, to 
it's amazing to me what we can do from the ground just by adapting these older systems um, as they as they age. Sometimes uh, due to the radiation environment, some of the hardware will just die and we have workarounds that we can do from the ground. That's really, really interesting because um, you, you sort of think back to the uh, Hubble servicing missions and you actually had shuttle astronauts going up and, and physically fixing and, and upgrading, but the, obviously that, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, but, but now you can sort of do, do a lot of it from the ground. That's right. So when, when we designed Hubble, it was designed with these built-in redundancies and with, well, almost all of the, the um, uh, almost all of the computers and things were very completely redundant and we were able to, uh, from the ground, adapt as, as some of those things fail. And so, for instance, the gyros, um, these are these are instruments, they're, they're um, transducers that allow us to sense how the telescope is moving in space. And so we use that to get from one star, one target star to the next. We command, we command the, t- the telescope to move from one target to the next, and the gyros tell us how it's moving and, and, and such. The, there are six of those, and uh, they have slowly over time just failed one after the next as anticipated. Uh, but uh, we're able to come up with new um, algorithms to allow us to use fewer. We thought we needed three um, of these gyros in orthogonal axes to get to be able to do this task, but we're we're actually able to do it with just one using new new um, uh, approaches and and using some of the other functionality on the spacecraft. It's really amazing. And, and quite beautiful to see this uh, ingenious adaptations to work with that aging observatory. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does sort of it does sort of take you back to, to what you were saying um, before about the, the fact that, you know, JWST can't be maintained or serviced if anything should go wrong or any sort of new hardware want, wants to be added. Um, did or does that concern you or, or other JWST scientists? I have yes, the JW, the JWST scientists have sat up nights, and uh, I I know these these men and women personally, and they have really been very concerned that on the transit out to this L two Lagrangian point two, that these big deployables on JWST perhaps wouldn't work. Um, one of those, any one of those deployables, say the secondary mirror deployable if that didn't work it would just be an enormous piece of space junk sitting out there and we we would need to send a, perhaps a robot to nudge it open or something like that and i remember when we were originally discussing uh james webb space telescope it used to be called the next generation space telescope ngst and i argued that we should deploy everything in low earth orbit and then gently nudge it out to the lagrangian point so if something did go wrong we can potentially send up people, but the the problem with that is, um, if if you'll recall, the Hubble Space Telescope has these grapple points on it. It's it's the entire observatory is rated for human interactions on it, and that's a that is a very high hurdle. You can't have astronauts come up to a spacecraft that's not designed that way. It puts them in great danger. So. Before astronauts were even allowed out of the space shuttle, we'd grapple it with this the Canadian robotic arm, make sure that everything's settled, and then send them out. There's no mechanism like that on James Webb Space Telescope. It just wasn't designed to be um, human-rated. And, and so the implications there are if we had designed it to be uh, grapplable and human-rated, it would be very much more expensive. You could easily add uh, another billion to it just for that. So um, it does trouble many of my colleagues that were not able to service it. But the amazing thing is, is the dang thing worked. We sent it out to Lagrangian point, all these deployables popped out, just really improbable. Just, it came out of this tiny little package and it's this absolutely enormous telescope uh, with the mirrors themselves deployed from a small package. Uh, I don't know. I was there was a lot of, of um, 
pucker factor, sending that out to to L2 without um, having it deployed before it was gone out there. But it does <laughs> seem to be coming together really well, and I'm very excited about that science. Absolutely. Those, I mean, at the time of recording, we've only really just had the sort of uh, calibration images, but but it's, it's it's all looking really good. And I was wanting to sort of go back to um, exoplanets um, because uh, another sort of big milestone that's happened as we were at the time of recording is um, NASA has just sort of said that we've we've just passed the five thousand confirmed exoplanet mark. Um, and I was wondering, I was wondering, well, I was wanting to get your thoughts on on sort of JWST's contribution to to exoplanet study and. What, what, what you're looking forward to from that aspect of the mission? Right. You know, um, so JW is going to be looking in the near and mid-infrared wavelength ranges. Um, so that can tell us a lot. There's a lot of very interesting biomarkers that you can pick up in that range. And so biomarkers are, well, if you can imagine, there, there's, there's four principal biomarkers that we look for. These are molecular lines that you see in the spectrum of the atmosphere of a planet. And if you, if, if any of those are out of equilibrium in the atmosphere, that suggests that something's going on there. If, and each of those, each of those biomarkers, there are geological processes that can produce an out of equilibrium state for, for them individually. But if you get all four of them, then that's almost certainly life. So you've identified life on that planet because life is what what generates all four of these. And just uh, so you would see those indications in the atmosphere. And you're going to see that in the near and mid infrared. So there are, even though James Webb Space Telescope really wasn't designed to look for exoplanets, primarily looking for, you know, the, the um, uh, first stars, the very early universe, which is all at very high redshift. So the very most distant, uh, parts of the universe that are far back in time, 13 billion years or so, maybe 12, 12 and a half, 13 billion years ago, these wavelengths have all been stretched very far into the infrared. And that's what JW is really designed to help us look for. We'll be looking at um, a number of things, looking for uh, uh, something called baryonic acoustic oscillation, uh, which is a um, uh, something that was supposed to have happened very early in the universe, essentially sound waves rattling around in this ball of hot plasma shortly after the universe began. So uh, those, once the uh, light, once the universe cooled enough for the electrons that had formed to bind with the protons, all of the photons went flying out of this ball of, of um, uh, plasma and the, those acoustic waves rattling around in this ball of plasma are still now, um, they are imprinted on those photons. And we can still, and we can tell a lot about things like dark energy and dark matter from that. So um, I'm, I'm just really excited to find out, especially, well, we have this uh, telescope called the um, Roman Space Telescope, which is also going to help a lot with that. It's going to look at try to help us understand about uh, dark energy in particular, which still mystifies me. I really have no idea what that is, but, and it's not my science either. <laughs> I'm just pretty <laughs> lost when I get to talking to people about it, but. Yeah, this is the uh, telescope that it used to be called W first, didn't it? Is it, is it it's the same telescope? Yep. It had this uh, fairly unimagin unimaginative name called W first, which is wide field infrared survey telescope, fairly bland. We usually do that when, when it's in development. And then once it gets closer and we're into phase A, where we're actually designing and putting things together, then we'll give it a name. And in this case, it was named after Nancy Grace Roman, who is this absolute giant in the world of astrophysics. So uh, named, named after her. <laughs> yes, and one of the things that it really um, blew my mind when, when I was sort of looking into that that mission, it must have been about a year or two ago when I sort of the first came across that mission, when, when it was called W First, um, was, th was this notion of detecting uh, exoplanets via microlensing. I was wondering, wondering if you could uh, 
just explain a bit about that? Because it it, it just sounds like absolute science fiction. <laughs> it, it really does. And it's absolutely improbable sounding. So let me try to create an uh, image in your mind and your listeners. So if you can imagine, imagine a universe where there's exactly one star and nothing else in it. So you have one star in the center of this otherwise completely black universe. You are a massless observer. So some sort of godlike being, you're flying around and you're observing the star, right? And you're looking at the star and it's just sitting there doing absolutely nothing. It, let's suppose this is a very nice quiescent star. It's doing absolutely nothing. All of the light rays are coming directly radially out from the star because, of course, space-time is just flat because there's only one mass in it, the star. So now imagine a second mass. You introduce a second mass that comes between you and this distant star. It could be a black hole might be a neutron star, free-floating planet, or a planet about that's in a bound orbit about a, a, a star. That comes between you and that distant star that was the only one in the universe. Now, suddenly, the gravitation, the mass of that intervening, intervening object will warp space-time. And it causes the, the dilation of time around it. So the closer you are to a large mass, time moves slower. And light always takes the path of least time. So what that means is light rays that were traveling, traveling radially away from that distant star now are, have to curve inwards to take that path of least time because the time is slowed down around this new mass. And that is very much like what a lens does. If you can, in your mind's eye, think of just your typical convex lens, just like the one you used to fry ants with when you're a boy, that it's as if you passed a lens in front of that distant light source now. But the instead of having the uh, index of refraction of a piece of glass cause this warping or this, um, this change in the trajectory of these light beams, it's actually the warping of space-time that does that. So you can tell a lot about the intervening mass by how it affects the light from this very distant source. And that is gravitational microlensing. So we can pick up things like this recent detection of a stellar mass black hole using this technique. It doesn't have to emit light. It can just be a, a piece of nothing like this solar mass black hole, but it actually causes this, this warping of space-time that we can detect and tell a lot about, about the object. And it's really important because the... Gravitational micro microlensing, this technique, is very sensitive to planets that are from the habitable zone about a star on out to unbound planets. So if you can imagine planets getting further and further away from their host star until they're just no longer affected by the gravitation and they're just floating through space by themselves. Theory tells us that these planets are almost twice as common as stars in our galaxy. So say it's 200 billion stars and the Milky Way, so 400 billion free-floating planets. Just And some of these could be like brilliant places for life to begin. Uh, very quiescent, uh, giant planets with thick envelopes of, of gas, uh, very, like, like Jupiter. And so they, for, for eons, they could have this very quiet, quiescent um, environment where life can begin. It's a very, very cutting edge idea in science right now. And um, so gravitational microlensing tells us a lot about this regime of planets from the habitable zone about a star on out to unbound planets. And there's no other technique that allows us to do that, except for, uh, of course, there's direct imaging of planets, but that is, that is just really hard. Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will be a pathfinder for a kind of observation to allow us to do these direct detection of planets around other stars. Uh, but that's, that's just really hard to do. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a pathfinder, but um, yeah, so it, it's, um, yeah, it's just very, very exciting. It really is. And it's, it sort of seems like um, one of many uh, exoplanet um, missions that are going to be launched. I mean, the European, Sp European Space Agency has, has quite a lot coming over, you know, coming up over the next 10, 20 years. A Euclid for one thing. So absolutely, yeah, yeah. Euclid—that's an interesting one. It'll be working in the uh, 
visible wavelengths. And it, it actually, its primary purpose in life is to look for uh, evidence to help us understand dark energy. However, we can repurpose it to look for exoplanets using specifically gravitational microlensing. So one of, one of the projects that we're working on is to combine uh, uh, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope with Euclid to get something called microlensing parallax. And that will allow us to detect and, and get the masses of free-floating planets. Very cool. It's just, that's just bleeding edge science right there. <laughs> <laughs> so given all, all these amazing techniques and the, the amount of missions that are going to be launched are you optimistic about, about the prospect of us actually being able to to detect life on, a, on an exoplanet within, within our lifetime for example um, if it's there yeah yeah i expect well i'm going to put myself out there and say that we should have evidence of life somewhere out outside of earth probably within the next decade so with, really? cer- certainly within your lifetime, I would say within the next 10 years, because it's this, it's, it's a profound confluence of science and technology. So our understanding of where to look for life, together with the technology to permit us to make the necessary measurements to find life. And that is all coming to uh, fruition right now in this epoch. So we're... Eh, to clarify, I'm not talking about fancy life, so life that can communicate. This is the kind of life that you uh, you scrape off the bottom of your shoes after a walk in the park, that kind of life. So just blorps of some horribleness on a rock. But <laughs> it will still have, you know, and, and it could be on Mars. It could be on uh, one of the moons of the exterior giant planets, or it could be from JW or uh, at Hubble Space Telescope. Measure, making measurements of biomarkers in planetary atmospheres. But within the next 10 years or so, I'd venture that uh, we'll find uh, scientifically compelling evidence of life off planet. Um, and there are, of course, there are concerns about uh, the possibility of civil unrest when this happens. Um, I'm beginning to write a book on that um, about, you know, getting, getting, thought leaders, especially in uh, r- religious thought leaders, to give their thoughts on, okay, this is going to happen soon. What do you think? So that's kind of a project that I've begun work on. And I thought I maybe would start with, with my own podcast and just set some people down. It's like, okay, well, what do you think? How, how is your constituency going to react when this happens? It's not a question in my mind of if it's going to happen. It's when. There, there are... Something like, what is it, 72 septillion stars in the universe? And now what science tells us is that planets are, are at least, well, approximately twice as common as stars. And that's just free-floating planets. We, we find that uh, most stars have a retinue of planets. And in my opinion, the universe is just going to be replete with life. And I like to think of life as almost a state of matter. You have solid, gas, liquid, and life. So given the right conditions for a long enough time, life will just arise. And we're going to find it really soon, certainly within our lifetimes. What do you do when, when, when you find it, um, but it, it's on an exoplanet, you know, that's too far away to send a, a probe to with, within, within one person's lifetime? Yeah, so when, when confronted with that, I always feel a little bit forlorn. It's, it's, it's sad that the, the distances between stars are so vast. But we can tell an awful lot just from, just from these signatures. Um, and it, tells, it can tell us a lot about the rarity and the preciousness of, of, of life on our planet. I think a lot more and will make us re- really reflect on the vastness of space and the, the, the preciousness of life on our planet. And I, that's my takeaway all the time. I look up at the stars and I think about us. I think about home. So that will be one of the principal takeaways. It's like, well, how common is life in the universe? And how common is intelligent life? And how rare is humankind and the other intelligent species like dolphins and whales 
and octopi. How, how common are those sorts of things? It's, a, it's, a, it's really a new golden age for astronomy right now. I mean, and if you think about it just for a minute, so right now in all of human history, we are alone in the universe, right? Up until, up until this present time, we're completely alone. We have no evidence, no scientifically compelling evidence that there's life anywhere else in the universe right now. In about 10 years, that will change forever. Suddenly, we're not going to be alone in the universe. So that will be really childhood's end for humankind, to be now recognized that we're part of a universe that is just replete with life. And all those possibilities from that, that's happening now while you and I are alive. And it's just amazing. It's profound. It really is. I mean, I... I know you're a big fan of uh, Carl Sagan, and it 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 does it does bring you back to um, you know his uh, famous pale, pale blue blue dots um, uh, speech, and it's the the idea that you, you as as a human being when when you're going about your life to to you planet Earth is the universe, and all and all the we all the sort of trivial things that that you think about in your your day to day. But if, if you take if you take the time to to say, for example, look observe a bird landing on the branch of a tree and you just think we don't know of anywhere else where anything even remotely as beautiful or complex as that is happening yeah and and i think it has it has great importance for people to take the time to do that you know just go out at night look up at the stars and reflect on the rarity of life and the the immediacy of these, these beautiful things, the, um, the, the, the very shortness of, of life. And it's important to, to put yourself in the universe and to realize that, uh, earth is, is not, well, it's special, but it's not, it, it's not a particular perch where that's central to the universe at all. So it's, it's important to get your head around that idea that the earth just isn't the center of the universe and to confront that issue <laughs> just by looking at the stars and then looking at the beauty of life around you. And that's not to say that I'm some sort of atheist. I am not. So well, I don't know if we even want to go on that adventure, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, just just th- thinking even, even further into the future... Um... You know, JWST and, and the Roman Telescope. Um, where do we go? Where do we go after that? Can can we send or, or should we send space telescopes f- further out into space? Is there benefit in doing that? Should, should we put observatories on the moon? That's a great question, and we have done a lot of thinking about it. Actually, my my own dissertation, which I did back in two thousand eight at Johns Hopkins, we were working on something called a long baseline stellar interferometer, and it. I was being specifically groomed for something called the terrestrial planet finder interferometer. And so what this thing is, you take two or more telescopes and you, you intercept light from very distant objects, say a planet around a star. And you, I don't know if you remember Young's double slit experiment from high school physics. Uh, when you have, when you have two slits in a screen, you can actually, you get this interference pattern from, from a distant object, okay? And so the interference pattern has uh, places where it's constructive and places where it's destructive. So if you take, if you move the telescope such that the destructive part of that interference pattern is right over the central star, then you can see the faint material around the star, including planets. And this will be very necessary in the future to look to look and assess and characterize planets with life on them that's going to happen we're, we're going to have to build that uh, in 2010 it was set aside because it's just technically monstrously difficult but all of the amazing technology that we have created for james Webb space, space telescope uh, will be part of that we we one of the reasons why James Webb is is fairly expensive for a space mission, we had to develop things from whole cloth, uh, things that are just really improbable. Um, step and hold actuators. Um, 
how to phase all these gigantic mirrors and make them into one big mirror. Uh, all those types of technologies will now allow us to to build things like a long baseline stellar interferometer. There's there's uh, one of my colleagues actually wants to put one on the moon. It'd be a very good very good spot to put one. So that that's on down the line. We're once we have this detection of life that I think will will be happening very soon. There's going to be a lot of excitement around that, and and we'll go back and revisit these techniques. Um, and that's pretty much where where astronomy is headed right now. Fantastic. Well, it seems like there's going to be a lot to look forward to in the next next few decades. And then I'm really looking forward to it, as I'm sure you are too. But um, yeah, I think it's about, that's about all the time we have. I just want to say thanks very much for, for speaking to me today, Richard, for coming on the podcast and sharing with you your, your insight and expertise. It's, it's been amazing talking to you. Great, Ian. I really enjoyed talking to you and I hope your listeners enjoyed it. We have some really nice websites at, at NASA and I have my own website that I go into a little more detail about how uh, microlensing works. It, it might be worth a look. <laughs>